So um, when Obama comes in, you know, you, you've gone through this period of time where the, where the uh, Bush administration had given up on the relationship with the Russians but, and Putin. Uh, but Obama comes in and they, they have this reset. It's sort of this idea, a very idealist I idea, uh, possibly naive, um, about go moving forward. That, you know, Putin is no longer uh, president. Yeah. Um, um, what's going on and why does that go south quickly? Well, I think there's a, there's some optimism with uh, with with Obama that he can solve all of these tricky international problems in a way that Bush couldn't because Bush was this, you know, hawkish, uh, you know, Texas bumpkin that alienated so many of our allies around the world, um, especially after the Iraq War, where there was obviously a big difference of opinion between uh, Russia and the United States on that. Um, that at the UN Security Council, you know, Russia had, had continued to play an, a very adversarial role, blocking all of uh, Bush-era um, objectives. You know, and Obama, I thought, Obama came in and thought, well, this is another relationship that was probably uh, a victim of, of, you know, the neoconservative foreign policy, so let's take a look at it and let's repair it. And I think he, he overstated um, how much of the problem in the U.S.-Russia relationship was about Bush and Cheney and their aggressive foreign policy, and how much of it was just stru structural long-term differences between how Russia and the United States saw the, the post-Cold War world. But every new administration takes a look at uh, adversarial relationships and thinks that they can fix them anew. How quickly does it go south, um, how, leading up to Kislyak's um, statements by 2015? Well, what really makes it go south is Russia's meddling in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, right? After Ukraine, after Crimea, the relationship is, uh, falls apart. And by 2015, um, Kislyak has said this publicly, by 2015, the Russians were looking beyond the Obama administration. There was no chance for rapprochement in the last two years of the Obama administration. And Kislyak, being a very smart and gifted ambassador in Washington, understanding American politics, as an ambassador is supposed to do, he starts looking to the future, to the post-Obama, post, perhaps post-Clinton future, and trying to see who might be on the horizon. The animosity to Clinton, you just give us a little background on that. The animosity to Hillary Clinton is largely about the color revolutions in Eastern Europe. And it's about when she was Secretary of State, U.S. support for these pro-democracy movements that Putin opposed. Uh, to Putin, Hillary was trying to, uh, you know, interfere in, you know, in, in Russia's uh, in Russia's space in, in, in Eastern Europe. It's partly about that, it's partly about NATO expansion uh, in Europe, and he believes that uh, Hillary was uh, pushing and supporting, and the United States was supporting movements that were a threat to Russian interests. And if you're Putin, an insecure, you know, um, autocrat who is looking at neighboring countries that are being swept up in these populist democratic revolutions, he has to always fear that something like that could sweep through Russia itself. So to him, Hillary was, um, was threatening his rule in Russia at the end of the day. To the and, and the extent. And, you know, as you know from the intelligence community's report, this was a core um, reason that Putin despised Hillary. So it wasn't even, it, it, the intelligence community report, at least the unclassified version, suggests it was personal with Hillary Clinton. It wasn't just that American policy, American foreign policy, uh, was at odds with Russia on several issues. It was that this person in particular, Hillary Clinton, um, took actions that, that threatened Putin's rule. Tell us a little bit about the early interest in Trump. I mean, to the fact that Kislyak ends up at the at the Republican convention, yeah, um, and then the meetings that occurred, and and uh, it was folks within the the uh, Trump campaign who had had close ties. Uh, talk, talk a little bit yeah. about why the interest, what what you know, and what it, um, you know, uh, some of the details about what what the, what the proof is that there was connections of that sort. Yeah. 
So if you look at it from the Russian perspective, if you fill in some of the dots that we now can, can fill in from that period in 2015 and 16, they see one, a candidate like Trump who's talking about the U.S. pulling back uh, from, certain period, from, from, from certain spots in the world, pulling back from Iraq, questioning, probably most important to Putin, the usefulness of NATO, right? So already you just have an ideological alignment between Putin and Trump especially on two big issues, uh, how, how overstretched America should be in the world, and specifically its commitment to security in, in Europe through NATO. Then if you're Putin, you see um, him hiring and reaching out to a series of political advisors who have similar sympathies and or links to Russia. So this relatively obscure uh, national security advisor named Carter Page. Um, who, who has visited Moscow and his view of U.S.-Moscow relations, relations is much more amenable to, to Moscow than some of the hawks in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. national security circles. You see the campaign manager later on, Paul Manafort, who worked for pro-Russia Ukrainian parties and had spent years in, in Ukrainian politics, became close to uh, Russian oligarchs. This is someone, again, has, if, if you're, you're Putin, you're saying, huh, okay, this is a whole new team. This is not Hillary Clinton and her circle of anti-Putin hawks. This is a group of people that knows that region, is skeptical of NATO, uh, and has, is probably willing to, to reach out to Moscow. You add into that Michael Flynn, the national security advisor, who Putin had dinner with in, in, in Moscow. Um, and, now you just, and, and then you add into that the Trump team's own, you know, sort of interesting uh, forays in, in, into Moscow with the beauty pageant um, and the fact that, you know, uh, as one of Trump's kids once said, most of the, the, the money coming in to, their, to, their, uh, to, to the Trump organization is, is Russian money. So it's either Russian, uh, it's many, you know, lots of uh, Russians buying Trump real estate in the United States. So even if, if, if there's nothing nefarious, just all of those links from Moscow's perspective, they had to be thinking, wow, this is someone at the very least we can do business with. The, um, the fact of yeah. Kislyak uh, being at the convention and, 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 and all of that that yeah. leads to some later controversy over people rejecting the idea that they had ever met him. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, just talk a little bit about that. And then if you look at Kislyak's you know, very aggressive diplomacy, I guess you would call it, during the election, he clearly, um, at least as far as we know, he's clearly giving up, given up on the Clinton campaign. It doesn't seem like he's doing much outreach to the Clinton people because he doesn't think it'll go anywhere. But he's, it's, he seems to believe that there's this opportunity with the Republican Party and with Trump, which is very unusual because in recent history, the Republican Party has been much more hawkish on Russia than the Democratic Party. Um, famously, in a 2012 debate between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, Mitt Romney described Russia as the number one geostrategic threat. Obama mocked that idea and, you know, Lo and behold, he was probably he was probably right. Well, you fast forward to 2016, at the Republican convention, and Trump has now overthrown the uh, the the hawks in the Republican Party when it comes to Russia, and this actually plays out in the platform committee at the convention in Cleveland, where. Um, Look, on Capitol Hill, it is standard policy among Republicans that the United States, the United States should arm the, um, the, uh, arm the Ukraine in its uh, f uh, f uh, war on, on its eastern border with Russia. Obama never did that. He didn't think it was a, a wise strategy, but that was Republican uh, policy. At the Republican convention, there's a debate about this. And language is offered. That, uh, to, to, to support this policy, which all the Republicans in Congress support, that um, the United States should actually uh, uh, give lethal aid to the Ukrainians. And through some machinations of the Trump campaign, that language is stripped from the party platform. So again, if you're Moscow, and this is, and look, and 
If you're Moscow, you're seeing that and you're saying, wow, this is a campaign with all of these advisors who are more open to having a relationship with us. This is a candidate who talks about NATO and talks about uh, uh, international affairs in a much more, in a similar way uh, to Putin, where he doesn't talk about democracy and human rights. He just talks about each country, each, each nation's own uh, interests. Um, and now at the, at the convention, the Republican Party, which were always such hawks on this issue, they're now overthrowing the idea of arming uh, uh, the Ukrainians. So from Moscow's perspective, it's getting better and better by the summer of 2016. Clapper by 2015 is, is looking at uh, intrusions yeah. by the Russians and is, is, is starting to ra raise red flags. What's the, the tenor of that period of time? Is there early warnings? Um, what, what do we know about that? Yeah, so we know from, we know from the intelligence community's unclassified report that there was this early period of testing um, and that they actually were in the DNC servers for months. Um, they apparently were in uh, some Republican uh, Party uh, equipment as well. And that's not necessarily groundbreaking or unusual. Um, the fact of, of, of the fact that Russia was testing, exploring, trying to conduct surveillance on our political parties is not exactly shocking or surprising. We're doing the same thing in you know God knows how many countries around the world. What was really changed everything, and what was really um, surprising, and um, uh, more problematic is it went from a an espionage campaign of stealing information to a campaign to disrupt, discredit, and attack the election by dumping, leaking uh, the information. That's what made it so different than things in in the past. That it turned into a uh, uh, a, a, informa a propaganda campaign, um, an active measures campaign by releasing all this information on the internet. Stealing is one thing, actively using the information for propaganda purposes is a whole different level. So you're at the convention, the Democratic yeah. convention, yeah. days before um, the, the dump, the WikiLeaks dump yeah. uh, of the uh, DNC uh, emails was done. Yeah. What is the thinking about what is taking place? What is the, what is the, the Clinton administration um, um, uh, campaign sort of view towards it. It had an impact at the convention because um, it some of these emails showed a pro-Clinton bias from some of the senior people at the DNC. And to the Sanders people who still, there were some holdouts, holdouts at the convention, and to them this was this you know great conspiracy against Bernie Sanders by the establishment. So it had the, it had the effect that um, Putin probably wanted. That is to say, it damaged Hillary Clinton at her most important moment. It stirred the pot of this Hillary versus Sanders uh, drama in a pretty dramatic way. And the head of the DNC in the middle of the convention, which she was running, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, is forced to resign. Um, so it is the first moment in the campaign where the Russian uh, operation really starts to damage Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. And I'll never forget the mo one moment of, of uh, being at that convention and uh, being in one of the halls with an enormous TV and all of a sudden Donald Trump is, is talking and he's talking about Hillary Clinton's emails and he makes this bizarre public appeal for the Russians to hack and find the 33,000 missing Hillary Clinton emails. Um, he seems to be asking an America, America's greatest adversary to hack into the computers of his opponent. Um, people talk about collusion. Did Trump collude with Russia? Well, at the very least, he was open and willing to uh, support Russian uh, hacking of, of his opponent, and he did it publicly. And um, maybe you should take it out of chronology. The, the, before this happened even, I mean, yeah. you've got a meeting in July. New York yeah. in June. Um, yeah. June or July? June. June 16th? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Um, 
where you know you've got uh, a, a connection uh, in England, for, but with with the Russians, um, that's saying the Russian government wants to pass you some damaging material on to, yeah. uh, to Don Jr. to uh, 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 about Hillary Clinton and the the agreement to go along and actually have that meeting, and not only with yeah. Don Jr. but with Kushner and with Manafort. Um, so. Yeah. To t talk about that. I mean, you have all these moments where the Trump campaign was basically putting a sign outside that said, saying to the Russians, we're open for business. Um, take the meeting in June 2016 at, at Trump Tower. Um, people say again, was there collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia? Well, at the very least, they were open to collusion, right? They had an intermediary say, hey, the Russian government supports your dad's campaign, and I want to set up a meeting with some people who have some dirt on Hillary Clinton. And the immediate reaction from Don Trump Jr. is, yes, love it, let's do it. And they set, they set up the meeting. So we don't know yet if that was uh, a coincidence, that if those the, 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 the Russians that the Trump campaign met with in June 2016 had any formal relationship with Russian intelligence services. But I'll tell you this, um, Michael Hayden, who is the former head of both the CIA and the NSA, told me that every uh, counterintelligence officer that he has talked to believed that that was part of an intelligence operation, a so-called soft approach to the Trump people to find out if they were willing to have some kind of relationship. And what they learned from that meeting were two things. One, they were willing, they took the meeting. Um, and two, they didn't report it to any of our intelligence services or FBI. Those are the facts that, from an intelligence perspective, the, the Russians would have gained from that meeting even if they gained nothing else. But it showed that they were able to get a foot in the door when they wanted to. And what did not reporting it tell them? It told them that these guys might be open to having some sort of relationship. Now, did it go beyond that? Did it become something more formal? We don't know. That's what the FBI is investigating. Um, the um, one last thing about the commit, were there, did you see demonstrations? I mean, did, did it, did, um, did it spur the the, um, the walkout? Yeah, I saw. Yeah, yeah. Ex explain that. I mean, one of the most dramatic moments at the convention, which was helped along by the WikiLeaks disclosures, was Sanders people getting up, walking out of the convention, going across the street to this media area, and basically occupying it for a while. Myself, other reporters, we left the convention to go cover that. Right. Um, that's really unusual. Conventions haven't, you know, no convention has had a serious walkout like that in a really long time. So r the, this Russian campaign successfully affected Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, convention. It helped pit the Sanders people against the Clinton people. Now, some people argue, well, it doesn't matter where the information came from, it was true, and so this really happened. The Sanders people had a right to be pissed off, um, so what, what does it matter? But the fact is that this Russian propaganda effort um, damaged Hillary Clinton at her most important moment when she was receiving the nomination to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. Did any of Hillary's people come to you and sort of say, hey, you know, I, I, we realize the email story is big, but do you guys understand the importance of the Russian story? You know, no, not okay. then, not then. So but by, in March of 2016, Podesta's emails are uh, hacked into. Yeah. Um, it doesn't come become known until way after that, that, yeah. that, that, that the material is going to be dumped. Yeah. But before that, in August, uh, late August, Roger Stone comes out and sort of yeah. makes this statement about the fact that Podesta is next. Yeah. What What do you read into that story? So, Roger Stone is a very complicated figure, and sometimes takes credit for things that maybe he didn't have anything to do with. Doesn't always um, speak in the most factually accurate way, and so you have to be careful uh, about you know. What, what, what it's true here and what's not. But the fact is, he did seem, he, he publicly tweeted that Podesta was next. His time in the barrel, he called it. Um, I've talked to him. He has denied any 
for, uh, knowledge of what was coming. That's his story now. Um, but it sure is interesting that he publicly tweeted the fact that this seemed to be coming and that he previously had bragged about having uh, a link to WikiLeaks. Um, so this is one of the reasons that the FBI is so interested in Stone and his potential role in this story, because he's a longtime Trump advisor, and it's, he was suggesting at a crucial time that he knew uh, WikiLeaks was about to release information about the Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. And the strange aspect of it also is that he, he, ha he admitted connections to Grusiver 2.0, who the intelligence folk state it was stated afterwards was it was not an individual but was tied into the Russian government yeah. <clears throat> I mean what is what does that say <clears throat> yeah and stone was as he's explained this as, as innocent but he did have uh, direct message conversations on Twitter with uh, Guccifer 2.0 which the American intelligence says is a just made up identity for a cutout that Moscow used to dump uh, the Podesta emails um, so was this Stone just finding out that there were these characters out there that might have interesting information and going to them on his own and trying to stir the pot? Or was it something slightly more organized um, where they had a, a prior relationship? And that's something the FBI is looking at. Um, the, 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 that summer, um, there's also a propaganda campaign that's that's going on. We later RT figured and, out is, is oh no. you know, through RT and yeah. Sputnik and, and social media. Um, oh, with the bots. It, and, it yeah. seems, and uh, yeah, botnets and whatever. Um, it seems to be pretty aggressive. It seems to be, and there's these, these news articles that, that come up and then are picked up by conservative radio hosts and then, then Fox and become sort of uh, uh, important stories that have legs yeah. about uh, Hillary being ill. Yeah. And um, I mean, one, look, one of the ways that Moscow hacked the election is. I mean, frankly, it's similar to the way that Trump hacked the election. They both understood conservative media in American politics. And they were able, through their Sputnik channel and RT television, and through a massive campaign that I still don't think we quite understand, of Twitter accounts, social media, fake news, that's where that, this phrase originally comes from, they were able to generate an enormous amount of anti-Clinton propaganda that fed into a lot of the biases of pro-Trump people, conservatives, people in American politics who just didn't like Hillary Clinton. They learned how to use our polarization and the way that our parties fight and that the way that our political actors fight online, they learned how to use that against us. You know, in the old days of the Cold War, Russia would look for uh, American weaknesses by exploiting our you know, lack of full commitment to civil rights or our support for dictators around the world. This, in 2016, they learned to exploit a different weakness, the polarization of American politics and the hatred between the, the two sort of warring parties. And their target, their target was um, Republicans, activists who hated Hillary Clinton and loved Donald Trump. And so they got right into the media bloodstream of the, the, the right in America and helped generate all of this content. The FBI was investigating from July, July on yeah. into the 21 states, and the number of the states seems to move around. Um, oh, investigating the, the election systems. Yeah, yeah. That, that, okay. that, that, the, that the Russian government was also <laughs> into the election systems. Yeah. And Jay Johnson sees it and starts talking to, you know, uh, states about lately and we need some protections here. And the worry seems to overtake the White House. This is, seems to be a point where yeah. it really picks up speed. What's what's going on? What's going on there? Um, and so, how important the, the White House views it? Well, the, the administration, which had more visibility into this than the campaigns or any of us in the press, and they know that Russia. Russian actors are testing our voting systems, which would be a whole level beyond the, prop, the, the stealing and, and dumping of emails, but actually messing with vote tally machines would obviously throw the election into complete chaos if they were able to do that. And that seems to get the administration's attention even more so than the hacking and dumping campaign. 
Um, and there's a vigorous debate in the Obama administration about how public the administration should be about Russia's intervention in the election. You know, coloring it, of course, is Obama and other officials' belief that Hillary Clinton's going to win. Um, and that's in, in the background of these conversations. But the debate is, do they go public? And then are they accused of meddling in the election, putting the thumb on the scales for Hillary, um, because they go public with this announcement that Russia is trying to elect Donald Trump? Um, or do they privately push back, uh, you know, private, send private messages uh, to, to Moscow to cut it out? Um, and they do, you know, they do, they do a mix of, of both. Brennan, uh, Brennan talks to his counter counterpart in Moscow and warns them. Um, Obama uses the famous red phone to, uh, to warn Putin. And then finally, they do put out a public statement um, in October uh, saying that they know that Russia at the highest levels uh, has taken these actions. Um, but the statement, frankly, at the time, it, there was so much else going on politically that it didn't have the impact maybe it should. So you've got two things. You've got two dynamics for Obama in making a decision about how public to go about the Russian campaign and in uh, interference campaign in the election. One is he thinks Hillary is going to win anyway. But two is the administration goes to Capitol Hill and talks to the senior Republican leadership um, in the House and Senate and on the intelligence committees, and they discuss taking a more forceful stance about Russia's interference. And they're told by Mitch McConnell the majority leader of the Senate, that if you do that, we're going to interpret that as you putting the thumb on the scales for Hillary Clinton. And so, again, one of the successes of, Clinton, of, of Putin's campaign in the United States is that he exploited the divisions between the party, even to the point where the two parties and could not get together and forcefully condemn the interference uh, in, a, in a unified statement. Then you've got po uh, a Trump statement, conveniently, sort of uh, when it comes out or not, um, that um, there's going to be a rigged election. So what does that do to the conundrum of the, that uh, Obama faces about how to deal with this? Yeah. And so this is all going uh, according to plan for Putin, because you s suddenly you have Donald Trump, who also thinks he's going to lose. And as a way either of justifying the loss or getting his, his vote voters motivated, he starts to argue that the election is going to be rigged. He did this going back to the primaries. Whenever he lost a primary or a caucus, he alleged that there was cheating going on. So he starts making the same argument that Russia's propaganda outlets are making, that America's democracy is fake and that it's, it's filled with fraud. Um, this is something that Putin does in all sorts of Western democracies. He tries to discredit the system. And Trump, whether wittingly or not, starts making the same, parroting the same claims that our system is, is fraudulent. Why is Russia doing this? I mean, what's, that, what's, in, what's in it for Putin? So if you, if you look at the intelligence community's assessment, it is one discredit a system of government that is a challenge to, to, to Putin. Right? He, he's done this in other countries. He wants to discredit our claim to be more morally superior in our system of government, so discredit the American democratic system. Uh, if you looked at RT and Sputnik during the campaign, it was just filled with stories about how ridiculous uh, America's system is, either ridiculous or, or fraudulent. Um, and he's, he's hedging his bets. He's, if Hillary Clinton wins, then uh, claims that the election uh, was rigged or stolen or fraudulent will discredit her administration. Um, and if Donald Trump wins, he's hit the jackpot. Was there a disagreement between the intelligence folks and the White House, where the White House was being very conservative and Obama, whose, whose motto was, uh, don't make things worse? Yeah. Um, was there some antagonism or was there some sort of debate that was between the two sides? There, yeah, so there's a big debate between the intelligence services, which are tearing their hair out over what they're, wit what they, what they're witnessing uh, the Russians doing, and the White House, which thinks, well, even 
yes, they're affecting the information flow in this campaign. Um, it looks like they've even tried to monkey around in the in the in the voting machines, but we, we can we can secure all that. And then I think then I think for Obama the debate is does it make it better or worse to go public in a big way about this? How important is it for the American people to know all the details that the intelligence community knew at that point? And the White House's decision is to be relatively um, silent about what it knew. And I think that was affected by two things. It was affected by Republicans who said, don't do it because we think that you'll, we'll accuse you of meddling in the election and trying to hurt Donald Trump. And two, the fact that Obama thought, like everyone else did, Hillary Clinton was going to win. And when so ele what, you know, election day occurred, happens, and Trump wins, did you f find from some of your sources that they were looking back at what had happened and realizing that they had made a dramatic mistake? On election day, um, the White House, like every other place, believed that Trump was going to lose and lose decisively, that Hillary Clinton was going to be the president. And so that night, after the... Wisconsin results from Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan made it clear that Trump was going to win. Um, a lot of Democrats, a lot of people at, at the White House started to reassess had they made a mistake, had Vladimir Putin just helped elect Donald Trump and by sitting back and not taking more aggressive action against Russia's meddling in the election, did they actually um, did they actually help Trump win? Um, as someone famously told the Washington po Post, um, one of the Obama advisors in a famous anonymous quote now to the Washington Post, um, person said, "We choked." Um, now, you could ask yourself, what could they have done? C could they have just made things worse? Could they have just given Trump an issue? where he would have attacked the White House for rigging the election by ginning up what he would have called phony claims about Russian interference. So, you know, you can't play the counterfactual. Um, but as a lot of intelligence officials have said, who knows what Putin's goals were originally when he started this campaign, but he could not have imagined a more successful outcome than getting Donald Trump elected president. Um, so let's talk about one day in, in uh October. So, uh, yeah, three thirty on October seventh, twenty sixteen, the DNI statement comes out. It's pretty forceful. Yeah, um, they think it is at least. It's only three paragraphs long. They take Putin's name out of it. At one point, Putin's name was in it. Yeah. Um, you know, why does that come out if the White House has been so careful up until this point? Um, and and what are the expectations? And 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 what's the reception? I think the administration thought this was going to be like dropping a bomb in the campaign, that everything was going, everyone was going to stop paying attention to what they were paying attention to and read this statement and say, oh my God, the, the administration is accusing Russia at the highest levels, that means Putin, of launching a, a, an interference campaign in our election and messing with our democracy. And that actors on both, in both parties were going to come together and condemn this and, you know, finally um, sort of, uh, you know, what was it? That, act that actors on, on both sides, actors from both parties were going to come together and condemn this and that it would blunt the effect of what Russia was trying to do because the Russians would see that our, our democracy was stronger than that they believed and that the two parties could actually come together and forcefully reject any uh, attempts at interference. Um, and that is not what happened. What do they say that, that, that is so forceful and, and how um, it's the first time that they say it? It's saying a few things that are incredibly important. One is that this is not, these are not rogue actors. This is Russia, and not only just Russia, but it's Putin. And two, that the intent is to help Donald Trump. Um, and that's a pretty explosive uh, press release from, from the administration but within minutes it gets overtaken by other news. What's the news? Um, so half, an hour, half an hour later. So 30 minutes later, the infamous Billy Bush, Donald Trump, Access Hollywood tape comes out 
and that pushes aside even the news of Vladimir Putin interfering in our election. And that tape becomes the dominant story of the day. A half hour after that, WikiLeaks releases John Podesta's emails. And there was so much to process that day, those three major stories, uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock, and 4.30. But the story that dominated, especially because it was a TV story, was the Access Hollywood tape where Donald Trump is essentially bragging about sexually assaulting women. But long term, or in the short term is the election, but yeah. the Podesta uh, emails actually in some ways supersede? Yeah, so the Access Hollywood tape is like this supernova that explodes on that day. The Podesta emails, it's like this fuse that's lit on, this, on that day and just slowly burns until it sort of blows up as you get closer to the election. Um, so what had more impact? Um, probably the Podesta emails, because there was so much in them that it just provided grist for stories on a daily basis. And it allowed Trump, in some ways, to seize on something to, put, to overcome the Access Hollywood tape, which was such a, a, a disaster for his campaign. You know, from that point forward, he starts talking about WikiLeaks and the emails and the revelations in the emails on a regular basis. So if the administration thought that that 3.30 statement was going to lead to this bipartisan, you know, uh, pushback against Russia and everyone was going to come together and say, we're not going to tolerate Russian interference in this election. Um, if they thought that maybe even the journalistic community was not going to allow itself to be sucked in by the, all of the tempting information in that leak, if they thought that the whole country was going to come together and, and oppose what Putin was doing, you know, they were, they were obviously wrong. Um, Putin, WikiLeaks, who knows how exactly, um, what, what the, what the, how the timing was determined but they released this information at Donald Trump's lowest point, and it allowed him to come back and win the election. And two days later, I mean, Trump is back, um, you know, uh, defending Russia. Um, and uh, this is after this damning information comes out. Well, how, why, how is he able to do that? Why is he doing it in that way? What it says about Donald's tactics. Um, um, I mean, the curious thing about Trump is that he's famously disloyal to people who have been close to him for long periods of time. He has no trouble attacking even his closest friends and allies. Think Jeff Sessions, um, think any of the people who he's been close to. But the one, the one person that he's never condemned, that he's always defended in some way, has been Vladimir Putin. And that is very perplexing. Um, it's just the one world leader that he's always, during the campaign and as president, he's shown some admiration for um, and never been willing to use any of the famous, famous Trumpian put-downs for. His closest advisors, he mocks to their face, but he's never done that with Putin. And, and, and the, what do you, what's your supposition about why that is? I don't know. His admiration for Putin is unusual given his relationship with most other people who he has no compunction about attacking, belittling, changing his mind about. He's never done that with Putin, though. So immediately after uh, so you have So now you have two tracks. You have the White House, which is aghast at what just happened and is now exploring a tougher response with sanctions against Russia for the, for the meddling in the election. And you've got the incoming president who's maintaining his pro-Putin disposition. And oh, by the way, his national security advisor, incoming national security advisor, Michael Flynn, is, has now built this relationship with the Russian ambassador where they are discussing what would happen uh, on any sanctions that the Obama administration institutes. So you've got like two governments doing foreign policy with Russia simultaneously, the outgoing and the incoming. December 1st is the, the Kushner's attempt to set up a back channel. What's going on there? So this meeting with Kislyak and Kushner and Michael Flynn is either just pure naivete, you know, Jared Kushner, who's never been served in government, is not a foreign policy expert. Um, he suggests that 
he, Kislyak wants to get Trump some information about Syria from Russian generals. Now, Kislyak, we now know, has a line into the administration, and he's exploiting it. Um, so just if you forget about the back channel stuff, just the fact that Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, is one of the people who's able to say, hey, Trump campaign, I've got some really great information on an important foreign policy issue from my Russian generals. I want to get that on your desk, right? So you've got Kislyak as essentially a foreign policy advisor in this meeting. And you have Kushner and, and Michael Flynn being OK with that and saying, OK, well, let's try and find a secure channel uh, to get that information from your generals, because Kislyak explains that they can't you know, come to the United States or use normal channels. So it, it's either evidence of some, some, it's either evidence of some kind of uh, collusion um, that is extremely eyebrow raising, or it's just pure naivete. Um, and with a lot of the links that have been reported, that's sort of the, the on the one hand, on the other hand. It's naivete uh, versus something more nefarious. December 29th, uh, Obama's in Hawaii, and he, um, he announces the sanctions. Yeah. Um, finally, some people say, um, people, some people say it had no teeth. Yeah. It, was, it was lukewarm stuff, not even like the sanctions, as strong as the sanctions after, that came after the, the Ukraine uh, yeah. involvement in Crimea. Um, to talk a little bit about, about that, anything you know about it. So Obama decides to kick out more than two dozen Russian ambassadors. He seizes two Russian compounds, and he institutes these economic sanctions against Russia that a lot of people think are kind of toothless. But, um, you know, we've already, got Russia, we've already got sanctions on Russia at this point, so there's only so much you can do. Um, so there's a debate about whether it was as forceful of a response uh, as was required. Um, but to the Trump people, it's, it's too forceful. Um, and so you have this very unusual 24-hour period where Obama announces the sanctions, and the entire Russian system responds, except for Putin, and you have tweets from, uh, from Putin's spokesperson and Russian uh, embassy official accounts all saying, Russia will respond in kind, and even saying precisely what they would do. At the same time that the Russian system seems pre prepared to announce its retaliation, the Russian ambassador, Kislyak, and Michael Flynn, the incoming national security advisor, are talking. Um, and we don't know exactly what they said in those conversations, but we do know that they discussed sanctions, and we do know that some, for some reason, Putin changed course and announced that Russia would not take any retaliatory measures for the United States' sanctions. Um, What's the reaction of the White House? So the White, so the, the, the White House, um, which knows a little bit more about what's going on, because Kislyak is someone that's routinely monitored uh, and surveilled, um, is starting to think, wait a second, are these links between the Trump campaign and the Russians, um, or at least some of the actors in the, in the Trump campaign, is there something more nefarious going on? Uh, and then, of course, this later, when, when Flynn is the national security advisor, this episode, these conversations with the Russian ambassador become part of the reason he has to leave the White House. It, it's clear because the act has been around forever. He knows he's being bugged. He makes the phone call to yeah. uh, Flynn down in the Dominican Republic when he's on a beach with, uh, vacationing with his wife. And, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, um, and this conversation takes place about sanctions. Yeah. W what's going on? No, look, there's, it's not necessarily unusual for an incoming national security advisor to talk to diplomats about major foreign policy issues, right? That's not, um, you know, most administrations are doing that, right, during the transition. The, the issue for Flynn becomes twofold. One, there is a law in the books since like the 1700s that you can't interfere with American foreign policy, the so-called Logan Act. Um, so there's one, a question of, of what did he say to Kislyak 
and did he say anything that could be interpreted as interfering with the with the administration's foreign policy? Um, now, a lot of prosecutors, prosecutors say, well, nobody's going to prosecute him for that. The second issue becomes uh, later on when he's asked about his conversations, he lies. He tells the White House, his White House superiors, including the Vice President uh, and others, that he wasn't talking about sanctions with Kislyak. That creates a circumstance where now the Russians know that Michael Flynn has lied to his superiors and it creates a so-called compromat uh, situation where Flynn could potentially be blackmailed by the Russians. Because you got Pence going on CBS on January 15th yeah. saying that, that there was no conversations about sanctions. You got Spicer on January 23rd denying it in front of the press. Yeah. So you have, you have Michael Flynn's uh, colleagues and superiors at the White House, including the vice president and the White House press secretary, saying sanctions weren't discussed. Um, and the Russians, and, especially, and Kislyak, know that that's not the case. Uh, and the other group that knows is the FBI because the, the transcript of the conversation is part of an FBI investigation. Um, so this catches the t attention of senior people at the Justice Department in January, uh, including the acting Attorney General Sally Yates, who calls the White House and says, hey, I have to come over there because I have something important to discuss. And so what happens? So Sally Yates goes to the White House, talks to Don McGahn, the uh, White House counsel, and she explains that Michael Flynn lied, that a transcript of the conversation between Kislyak and Flynn shows that they did discuss sanctions and that there are two issues. One is the potential Logan Act violation, but two, and much more important to the Justice Department, Flynn could be compromised. The Russians could blackmail him because he sent out his superiors to lie, um, and the Russians know this. So, you know, the scenario would be Kislyak subtly t t telling Flynn, um, you know, if you do, don't do X, I'm going to go public with the fact that we did discuss sanctions and ruin your career. That's the scenario that the Justice Department is deeply concerned about. Um, and they don't go to the White House until they make sure that the FBI investigation of Flynn, which was ongoing, was preserved, that if they needed to... Uh, to prosecute a Logan Act violation, they could. Once they, once they have that locked down, they essentially rush over to the White House and say, we need you to know this. Now, Yates, as she told me, did not recommend that they fire Flynn. They want, they, they, the Justice Department didn't believe it was their right to make that decision, but they told Donald Trump's senior advisors, and specifically his White House counsel, in forceful terms that your national security advisor is compromised by the Russians. She feels she's done her job, but lo and behold, the next day she's called back, and yeah. McGahn asks her if Flynn might be prosecuted. Yeah. And she, you, you sort of define the, this conversation, and, she, and she's puzzled by this whole thing. Just tell, tell, tell us that part of the story. Yeah, she's puzzled because she doesn't quite think that they understand how serious the the issue of the compromise is, right? So McGahn's asking these questions about prosecution and the Logan Act, um, and she's trying to get across that the, the real issue here it, from, from our counterintelligence folks at the Justice Department is the Russians have leverage over him. He's the national security advisor. He's the person that sits there when Trump is on a phone call with Putin. Um, and she does, she, again, she doesn't say you should fire him, but she tries to explain how serious it is that when the Russians have this kind of compromising material about someone, they will use it. And if uh, Justice Department and um, uh, FBI knew weeks before that because of the, of the uh, wiretapping, yeah. um, that indeed uh, sanctions were talked about, uh, wouldn't the president of the United States have gotten a briefing on that by his intelligence services? You would think. You would think that it would make sense that Trump would know either at the time what those conversations were, were like between Kislyak and Michael Flynn or after the fact when he's briefed um, by the intelligence community. The, but we don't, you know, but we don't, we don't, uh, you know, we don't know that. 
A couple of, let's talk a little bit about Comey's relationship with the president. The, yeah. The, a couple of hours after this meeting takes place, yeah. with Yates uh, uh, talking to the president's lawyer, um, uh, he has a dinner with Comey who, where he's asking for his loyalty. Talk a little bit about the relationship. Talk a little bit about Comey's reaction to the president's um, sort of attempts to get a closer relationship and, and sort of what he's asking of him. Yeah. So the same, the same day that the acting attorney general informs the White House that Michael Flynn is a security risk, um, Trump has dinner with the FBI director who's overseeing the FBI's investigation of Michael Flynn. Now, we don't know if Trump was informed about the Flynn, Flynn being compromised, but we do know, uh, according to James Comey, the head of the FBI, he was sort of lured into this dinner under, what he, under slightly false pretenses. He was told it would be a dinner uh, at first among a larger group, and then it turned out it was just him and the president. And this is the dinner at which Comey says Trump asked him several times in a few different ways uh, for his loyalty. Um, Putting questions in his mind about does the president understand the role of the FBI director and, and his, what his relationship with the president should be, I guess. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing wrong with the FBI director dining with the president, but um, in a normal relationship, the president would respect the independence of the FBI and not even hint at the active investigations, which could touch on the president himself. Trump didn't do that. Trump brought him over there um, and asked him for his loyalty, um, knowing that the FBI was already investigating Michael Flynn. And this happens on the same day that the Justice Department informed the White House that Flynn was compromised by the Russians. Why does it take a couple of weeks before Flynn is resigns or is fired? Um, why it took so long? Was it was it was Trump seemingly trying to protect him? This is, I mean, yeah. indeed after uh, way after um, the fact that Yates, in fact, was was fired for a different reason. Yeah. So basically, after Sally Yates goes to the White House and tells them the you know your your national security advisor is compromised by the Russians, nothing happens. Nothing happens until. The Washington Post discloses the same, the, the, the nature of the Sally Yates meeting and lots of new details about the potential compromise. Uh, still, Trump backs Flynn, tries to keep him as his national security advisor. The outcry after the Washington Post story gets too loud. It's clear that Flynn even lied to the Washington Post when they first brought some of the information to him, and Trump finally. Uh, asks Flynn to resign. A day later, he asked Comey to back off on the um, investigation. So what's even more unusual is Trump is not known for being loyal to people he discards. In fact, there was a whole TV show about his, how eager he was to fire people, right? And he gets rid of Flynn, and then the next day, he has a conversation with Comey where he asks him to back off the FBI's investigation of Flynn. This is unusual behavior on the part of Donald Trump. He's not someone that just goes out of his way to help aides who have, been, who have left his circle. That's not his MO. But for some reason, he felt like it was important to protect Flynn. Uh, he felt like it was important to actually go to the FBI director break protocol in terms of the president's relationship with the FBI director and the kind of red lines that you don't cross and actually push him to back off the Flynn investigation. So why? I don't know. There's some reason he felt that he needed to protect Michael Flynn. So then in March, in early March, you've got the president asking Comey um, uh, to say that he's not under investigation, the whole the whole thing, yeah. and you know statements about the fact eventually that uh, Comey three times had told him that he's not under investigation, and then by the end of March, or by twentieth, <clears throat> you got uh, Comey saying that the FBI is investigating Trump campaign connections, that FBI is, has been investigating them since July. Yeah, um, um, and then you got eventually Comey being fired. So yeah. Um, 
break off any piece of that yeah. um, uh, about the, how that relationship goes downhill to the, to the point where he, the uh, president actually fires the guy who is ahead of the investigations into yeah. potential collusion, potential what the, the, the background of the Russian hacking into the elections. Yeah, so the Comey-Trump relationship, it just gets progressively worse because Comey's not doing what Trump wants. Right, so he asks him for loyalty. That doesn't go so well. He asks him to bet to back off the Flynn investigation. There's no sign that he's going to do that. But I think that what really, really angers Trump and what leads him to fire Comey is that Comey went before Congress, revealed that the FBI had this investigation going on, and that it was related to Trump campaign, the Trump campaign and its associates. So that was a blockbuster day where Comey is telling the world that the FBI has a counterintelligence investigation of the president's campaign. That's big news. When Comey is asked at that hearing if the president himself is under investigation, Comey refuses to say one way or another. This is what sets Trump off. Trump, and this has been corroborated by, by Comey, was told by Comey uh, privately that the president was not under investigation. Trump asked him to go public with that. Comey didn't do it because, as, as he's pointed out, if that changed, then he'd also have to go public with the fact that the president is under investigation. But this was the key to, this is the thing that pissed off Trump more than anything else, is that Comey would not publicly say that the president wasn't under investigation. And not only would he not say it, when he was asked about it at, the, at, the, at this hearing, he would neither confirm or deny it, leading a lot of people to say, well, maybe he is under investigation. So I think that is the end of the, end of the line for Comey. And the day after he fires him, May 10th, into the Oval Office walk Kislyak and uh, Lavrov. Take us into that moment and sort of your overview of, of what was going on. I mean, you can't make it up. I mean, if this were a, a novel, it would be too absurd for the President of the United States to fire the guy who was investigating him. And oh, by the way, the reason he gave is because he didn't like the way that Comey handled the Clinton email investigation. Not because he didn't prosecute Clinton, but because he was unfair to her by revealing details of the investigation during the campaign, details of which Donald Trump talked about every day during the campaign as a way of clobbering Hillary Clinton. So the president now says that's the reason he's hiring the FBI director. The F same FBI director that is investigating his own links to Russia. Um, and then the next day, he invites the Russian foreign minister and the Russian ambassador, who is a part of the Comey investigation, into the Oval Office, brags essentially about getting rid of the FBI director, and basically says, now we can get this relationship back on track because I got rid of that nut job. You can't make it up. The Comey uh, uh, firing eventually leads, backfires with the, with the selection of Mueller as a special um, prosecutor, yeah. um, special counsel. Um, uh, how does this sort of, you know, what does this say about the tactics that, that Trump is using? Uh, yeah. What does it say about um, the system's reaction towards the White House's attitude about this this stuff. I mean, what's what, what's going on? So, if he had thought a few moves ahead, maybe he wouldn't have fired Comey. And I don't think he realized what he was getting when he fired Comey because it tri it triggered a series of events that has arguably made things worse for Trump. Um, Comey went public with a lot of their discussions in a way that was damaging to Trump and in a way that opened up questions about whether Trump obstructed justice. And it forced Sessions, the attorney general, to recuse himself from the investigation, which infuriated Trump because he believed that Sessions was there to protect him. It made Ron Rosenstein now the overseer of, uh, of the investigation. And Rosenstein very shortly, uh, very quickly uh, appointed Bob Mueller, a uh, no BS former FBI director, as the special counsel in charge of the whole investigation. So he's now, so the end result is Jeff Sessions, who was supposed to protect Trump in Trump's mind, is out of the picture. And 
Ron Rosenstein and the other officials at the Justice Department who are supposed to oversee the investigation are at least somewhat removed from the investigation because you have this much more independent-minded special counsel um, now and with a broad mandate to look into any, uh, any crimes that are uncovered. And in previous scandals, whether it's Watergate or the Monica Lewinsky scandal, when you've had special counsels or independent counsels, you know, depending on the rules at the time, these investigations can widen, spin far uh, out of control from the original mandate. Um, and Trump has boxed himself in, essentially, um, without a clear way to um, do what he was trying to do, which is get rid of the investigation. Um, so you do see a little bit the system working, that the president exceeding his authority, perhaps you know, arguably abusing his power in, in firing Mueller if his intent was to stop this investigation, but the system of checks and balances kicking in and preserving the investigation. I think that's you know, one bright spot in all of this. But the response of the president, of course, is to denigrate Sessions and say he's going to fire him and, and to go after Mueller and say, you know, you stay within your yeah. lines of what your investigation is said to do. Yeah. I mean, the reaction is is oblivious to some extent of, about the blowback. Yeah, he attacked, soon after he attacks Sessions because he didn't want Sessions to recuse himself. He attacks Mueller because, you know, Mueller's investigating him, alleges that Mueller is not allowed to look into financial transactions, which again is, um, is, a, is a strange thing for someone being investigated to say. It's like the cops are looking at your house, they're inside searching, and you tell them whatever you do, don't go in that closet. Well, it's the first door they're gonna open. Um, so, if, and if Trump, so if Trump believes that getting rid of Sessions or forcing Sessions to resign is going to help Get, make this investigation go away, he doesn't understand the process very well. Because you can get rid of Sessions, who are you going to find as your attorney general then? Who's, who's going, who, who is one going to take the job, or two be confirmed by the Senate? Hard to know who that person would be. But then it doesn't do anything about the special counsel, because the special counsel is under the control of the deputy attorney general, Ron Rosenstein. So to really get rid of Mueller, Trump needs to tell Rosenstein to fire him. If Rosenstein won't agree, Rosenstein would have to resign. Then the next Justice Department official would take over, and you'd have to have the same conversation until, as in the Saturday Night Massacre in Watergate, Trump found someone who would actually fire Mueller. If he did that, Congress, especially the Senate, um, I think would finally uh, put its foot down and especially Republicans who have been very reluctant to criticize Trump's moves on, on some of this stuff would finally uh, wake up and say, you know, enough, enough is enough. You've got to let Mueller do his investigation, especially now that a grand jury in D.C. is impaneled. If yep. you're flying the wall in the Kremlin, in the end, what must Putin be thinking about all this? What did he achieve with all this? If, if indeed the yeah. information the intelligence folks had is correct, um, what'd they get? I mean, Putin hit the jackpot. I mean, no matter what the outcome is here, Putin hit the jackpot. His goal was to make sure Hillary Clinton wasn't elected. He accomplished that, or at least he helped accomplish that. You know, um, he, in the end, he has thrown the American system into turmoil. I mean, that's probably the most important objective here. I mean, he probably um, never thought that he would that Donald Trump would do everything he said or that they'd suddenly agree on all of the issues that divide the United States around the world. It is true that in some respects, Trump's uh, over-the-top you know, praise of Putin and the Russia investigation, it has hemmed him in a little bit, right? Congress has passed a sanctions bill. Trump was forced to sign it, right? He didn't veto that, even though he didn't approve of it. Um, Trump has been forced to back NATO uh, rhetorically in a way that he didn't during the campaign. So in terms of the, and in terms of the policies, you know, Putin hasn't gotten everything he wanted, but he's effectively cast doubts about the American electoral system, uh, and that's a huge victory for him. And he has a president that, you know, very frequently on some big issues, is much closer to him than Hillary Clinton would have been when it comes to Europe, 
or Syria or, or fighting or terrorism or just in general um, condemning or having any problems with how Russia acts in the world. He's got, he now has an American president who sees the world the way Putin sees the world. That is someone who downplays democracy and human rights, thinks of uh, everything in terms of interests rather than values. That's a big victory for Vladimir Putin.